On today's episode of the show, I am joined by Cambridge Lions co-defensive coordinator Jake Zoll. Coach Zoll has worked with me both at Laurier and with the Cambridge Lions, uh, and in the fall we'll be starting uh, his American career at the University of Ohio as a student assistant there while he finishes up his degree. Coach Zoll has done a ton of work for us on um, adapting coverages to different formations, and we're excited to share uh, his work on defending isolation sets in this video. So this is your classic cover three double hold. Uh, it's a coverage I've actually come all the way around on. Um, a lot of people feel though it's kind of uh, elementary, basic. Um, they're really nervous and worried about the seams in the deep third zones between the corners and the free safety. And uh, that once you get up to the U sports level, I think that's definitely true and definitely something you need to be wary of. But when you look at, when you get your halfbacks to properly reroute, when you get your outside linebackers to drop to their landmarks, um, I think it actually does a really good job of covering both your deep stuff and getting an extra hat in against the run to give you an eight man box with that boundary half. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick overview of these cover three zones. Uh, so that when I use these terms later on in the presentation, you'll understand what I'm talking about and I don't have to re-explain everything every single time. So starting with the boundary corner here, um, he's, he's playing deep third. He's looking for two to one vertical. Uh, he's going to align inside of number one. Uh, he's going to drop to the numbers at about 12 to 14 yards. Uh, these landmarks, obviously, you know, if you're a Bantam coach, you can probably play it up a little bit more. If you're a senior varsity coach uh, or a senior high school coach, you might want to have them a little bit deeper. That's up to you. Uh, your boundary half playing in the flat here. Uh, he has to play. He absolutely has to align with inside leverage. One, so he can fit his gap in the run. And two, so that he can reroute number two outside so that especially on any kind of vertical stem, both he and number one are compressed into this boundary corners deep third zone here. And the boundary corner can play the both of them from the top down. So even if you get a curl or a comeback and a wheel or a fade route, the boundary corner can still play both of those concepts from the top down. And even if he stretched vertically, he doesn't have to be stretched horizontally. Helping with that horizontal stretch, you've got your Will linebacker here in the hook to curl zone. He is drop, he is relating in his drop to number two at about 10 to 12 yards. So when I say relating in his drop, what he's going to do when he's dropping, his eyes will be on number two. Uh, he'll be finding him at, and at the top of his stem. When number two breaks or keeps going, the will is then going to turn and run with that until number two take, completely takes him out of the zone. Then the last, the last uh, underneath zone here, because the Sam is just the same thing to the other side, same with the field half, same with the field corner. The last two, you have the Mike linebacker versus a balanced set versus a balanced set like a 32 or a two back 22 here. Uh, I've got him dropping off the back. Um, in American terms, they usually, they usually describe this as he's responsible for three weak, four strong, slash cut first crosser. Um, what I found in Canadian football is when I've been playing and coaching defense, just call that a low wall right? He's dropping off the back. He's playing a low wall. And instead of trying to run with the back, who will usually be fast to the flat, he'll push the Will linebackers or the Sam linebackers zone. So he'll push into that zone and free up the Sam or Will linebacker to then rally down, expand their zone a little bit wider, and then rally down to the flats once the ball's thrown. Uh, if the back stays in the down, or once the Mike linebacker has pushed to either side, 
he's then looking for crossers coming first to the side he dropped from and then opposite. And if he gets a route coming across the middle of the formation in the tackle box here, he's responsible for coming down and running with it all the way through so that the other players' zones don't get distorted by that low crossing route. Lastly, you have the free safety who's playing kind of universally how he would in any single high defense, like a cover one, uh, any kind of cover three, where he's always staying deeper than the deepest. He's usually lining in the middle of the field, maybe give or, you know, give or take a couple yards, depending how much range he has, how much you potentially trust him. Um, and he's reading uh, number three vertical immediately to number two vertical. Um, and he's just trying to really patrol this middle of the field and make sure nothing gets over top of him. So I've drawn up a couple of route distributions. Um, I specifically chose three plays. One where the running back stays in the down, which is a term that means that he's not immediately presenting as a fast threat to either side of the formation. So as a fast three to the boundary or a fast four to the field. Um, so versus this Argo concept, you can see here, if the boundary half does his job properly and gets a good reroute on number two into the boundary, then he really gets compressed with uh, number one there in the boundary corner is able to run and kind of midpoint them no problem. Your will, your boundary corner already went over it. He's going to, I've got him with these motion lines backing off a little bit. Um, I think when personally when playing defense, you want to show a static look as much as possible and then get to the different things you do from that one look. So during the waggle, he kind of backs off um, at kind of as late as you're comfortable letting him do, drops to his landmark, and then keeps running with uh, vertical routes on a midpoint there. Will linebacker, it's relating to this drop to number two, once he sees the vertical, the uh, number two continue on his vertical stem, he's going to follow the golden rule of zone coverage, which is that if somebody is going or leaving your zone, somebody is coming. So he'll kind of look back opposite um, and hopefully be able to pick up this divide route from number three, where he's not expected to turn and run with it. It's a lineback inside linebacker on a slot receiver. But what we're hoping for out of him is that he can get in the window so that the quarterback can't just drill it right in there, right? If you make the quarterback lob the ball over top of him, now the free safety has time to come down and make a play on it. So that's all we really want from there. Uh, this Mike linebacker, uh, I don't really have him drawn up. He's going to play that low wall. The other thing you can potentially have him do is if the running back for sure is just staying put and once he's checked with no crossers, you can even bring him on a delayed blitz. So I left him unillustrated there to kind of prove that point where depending on what you see most in your league or even week to week, you can kind of play with this assignment a little bit when the back when the back stays in the down, you have a little bit of flexibility for your help. Maybe you want him dropping immediately to number three to get into that uh, to get into that first window of the divide if you're worried about them hitting it early. Sam linebacker, he's got a tough job because, and this is where I think the hole in cover three hold really is, is uh, not so much the seam, the deep seams there but the Sam linebacker just has so much ground he potentially has to cover. Um, thankfully, number one comes across and he's a new number two now. So when Sam drops, he sees the vertical, his eyes on number two, see the vertical stem, see number two continuing through that vertical stem and his eyes naturally bring him to number one coming across. So he still has a landmark to get and relate to. And if for some reason um, the pass rush didn't get there in time, he would then have to uh, pivot and continue running through with this dig route. Your field corner here uh, is able to play the 
what is able to play the deep route from number two with good leverage, advantageous position. And because it's such a long throw out here to the hashes, again, short of the U sports level, um, that's when you get quarterbacks with a little more uh, arm to them where you have to worry about this conflict a little bit more. But your field corner can kind, can kind of play again, top down, where he's worried about this number two vertical fir first, but he can also kind of cheat and make sure they don't throw the dig back shoulder or that he doesn't hook it up. And if they, if they do try and throw that, he can be there and make a play on the ball. All right, next we have shallow. So this one is specifically is an example of the back uh, releasing to the field. So a couple of things that are different. The corners, you got a vertical set, the corners, you've got a vertical stem. They're going to turn and run with their routes. Um, on the boundary, he just tur he just turns and run with runs with one. Uh, to the field, because the guy, uh, because that number one hooks it up and number two is a threat immediately, uh, the field corner and the free safety are going to kind of end up bracketing that post to make sure you don't get any kind of double move, right? But we're really not going to worry too much about this uh, this curl. We're going to play inside of it, but outside of the post. Um, your free safety is going to play over top and inside of the post. Your Sam linebacker, again, is going to drop down into that, drop into that window. It's kind of a long drop. Um, now in the, in the halves, this is where it gets interesting and where really good halfback play really makes or breaks this coverage. So on a shallow cross route, this number two is going to be insistent on an inside release. You're not going to be able to completely deny it. I mean, maybe you can, maybe you can send him flying into the line. That would be awesome, but we can't expect that to happen every single time. You know, if for no other reason, then they might just start calling it um, for roughing or pass interference. But what you can do is if he's going to have an inside release, you can really flatten it out so that he's right on the heels of the defensive lineman, only two or three yards deep. Um, and what you also have to do is communicate. Communication is, I think it's key in coverage in general. Um, especially this one where you have so many guys underneath, uh, you need to yell something like a under, 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 or cut, cut, cut to whatever your alert word is to tell this Mike linebacker that he's got a crosser coming that he needs to cut down, right? Your will linebacker dropping off number two immediately sees someone's going, leaving the zone. So he's going to turn and look opposite, uh, yeah, he's going to look opposite and try and pick up the window on this dig route. Um, there will be a window where it's open. Again, that's where the holes are in this coverage to me is kind of those intermediate crossing routes. But those take a long time to practice and get good at. So it's give and take. Is that similar for the will there as when he's getting underneath uh, the diagonal route? So he's getting nothing from number – like he's not getting anything from number two because number two in the first one was vertical. In this one, he's underneath, and now he's looking for that kind of intermediate route from the field. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. He's going to relate in his drop always to number two first, and then once he realizes, once number two is trying to clear him out or has nothing to do with his zone, he's going to immediately look the opposite way of wherever number two went. He's he's going to look direct opposite of that. So if it's Let's just say for him, if it's behind him and to his right, he's going to immediately look forward and to his left. If nothing's there, he's going to turn and like he's going to turn and see if anything's behind him to that left. But he's really going to check opposite of his initial drop if number two if he can't relate to number two. So when the mic gets the, so the mic is going to drop off of the running back who is. In this case, a fast four. He's fast to the flat. Um, he's going to get that under or cut call pretty immediately. So he's going to come down on that under route, on that shallow cross route. And uh, 
is going to come down on that shallow cross route and uh, run with it, carry it through all the way. And then your field half, after rerouting the post and buying his underneath coverage some time to get there, um, he'll also need a call from the, from the mic, probably at some sort of out, 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 or fast, fast, fast. And he'll know that he needs to come down and cut it. He should have pretty good vision anyways, since uh, not, he should have pretty good vision anyways on that route where he can come down and still leverage it in the flat. All right, next up here, we've got our back week. Um, I bombered in number three there to make it a little more of a play you might see every day or a little more commonly in your league. And we've just got a flood concept into the boundary. So nothing especially difficult is happening to the field here. Uh, your field corner, he, since he's basically in an isolation now, he can more or less just run with this. Um, it's a vertical stem anyways, and he's not in any kind of conflict, so he can just play it and be responsible for it. Uh, your field half, again, is going to do his best to reroute number two outside. Um, if that doesn't happen, it's going to be flattened out pretty ugly there. Uh, Sam's going to try and drop off of number two. Um, he can look for anything coming backside. That's not going to happen, so he might as well just fill the void in there so that number one doesn't keep running eventually and come open. Uh, your Mike linebacker now is going to drop off of the back. And in this case, he's so compressed because there's no, uh, he'll be looking for the crosser coming immediately. I'm trying to be realistic with the timing here. So the crosser isn't going to be in the tackle box or in a position for him to cut uh, honestly, by the time the ball is thrown, if number two is coming from the hash here. Um, but hanging out in his zone here, that is something he'd be looking for. Uh, that is something he'd be looking out for. Um, but since the back drops, he's to, or since the back is fast to the flat as uh, number three to the boundary, he's going to drop that way and reinforce the coverage to that side or push it to that side. Your boundary half is going to reroute the uh, is going to try and reroute number two again. Uh, if you get an out, like if you get an out route, chances are they're probably going to try and stem it in inside. So hopefully you can disrupt it long enough for your will to get underneath of that. If they want, if they really are insistent on an outside release on an out route um that's it makes life a little tougher on your will actually to do that but uh it makes the read happen faster so your boundary corner can kind of come down and play that route uh from the top down as well so it's uh give or take from the oc's perspective there um, but again with the reroute it drops will time to drop in relation to number two and you can see he gets that outbreak on the top of his stem. Will, Will reads the outbreak out, off of the top of number two stem, so then he can just run with the out there. Three safeties doing what he always does, reading three to two. Two's kind of got a vertical stem. Nothing's coming from number three, so he's going to uh, slide his zone into the boundary there. I think, too, what's a good point is if they're going to outside release the out, Right. It actually, if, if your boundary half can just play 70 30 on that shallow route, he's got to keep leveraging horizontally with the back, but he can stay in between the back's flat route and that out route from the flood concept um, without totally, you know, buying down on the back. And that gives your will time to get there as well. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. And in general, when you're playing any kind of underneath coverage, as whenever you're conflicted, uh, between a deeper route and a shallow route in your same zone, obviously you want to cover the deeper route and take that one away first. So yeah, uh, having your boundary half kind of sail with that, similar to the Will or the Sam here, where he's not necessarily trying to turn and run with the guy, but just stay in the window so the quarterback can't drill it in there and hit it immediately. 
All right, so here is where we kind of get into the meat of things and the specialty of uh, this topic today. So defending 41 on most defenses that I've either coached or played for, um, coaches have always kind of treated it as a um, as a check, right? So whenever you got 41, you've only got one thing. You, you know, you've only got one, maybe two things that you can do to it. You just say, oh, we're going to check to HBO. We're going to check to this. We're going to check to that. Um, and what I find is that when I spent a couple of years as an OC, I loved getting into 41 because I knew exactly what I was going to get every single time. So what I really want to talk about now that we've gone over cover three and how it distributes is how we can kind is how we can adapt this base scheme to your overloaded uh, passing strength here. Uh, 41 or your 31 with a wing or someone in the backfield and still say sound and you don't necessarily have to have one or two checks you can just kind of play your base defense and then you know maybe have a tag or something on it instead uh, there are a lot of different ways you can call it split field uh, you can call it with like a trips or quads check um, but I, I think that's a much better way to go about it than just calling a base defense and having one check that you go to every single time. So what we're going to do here is we're going to flood the zone to the field. And it, sound, it sounds a little bit complicated. It's really not. Um, the biggest thing you'll notice here is there's a the big – the Mac and the Wills assignment really change where the Will now has that kind of low wall or cut first cross or responsibility. However, if the back releases into the flat or because this is Canadian football, he can motion out in, as to, to a number two receiver or get fast to the flat from a wing position off of that boundary tackle anytime he wants to. So you can't just play a zone with potentially only two people here with the will and boundary corner. Instead, you have to, if you're manned up with the boundary corner, you have to be manned up with the will as well, or you're just letting a guy run free and unaccounted for potentially in the passing game. So as you can see, I've got a few notes written up here. Um, if you're playing man into the boundary, uh, it's a, it's a two on two and you have, it's a two on two. You have to be manned up. If you want to play zone, uh, it has to be some sort of three on two. Um, and you also have to account for your first priority is that immediate passing threat, uh, into the boundary. That's your running back. Um, your second would be a crosser coming through because again, that's a player. You don't necessarily have anyone accounted for on the backside here. So we'll get a lot more into that with the upcoming slides and all of the different uh, solutions you potentially have in the boundary there. Uh, what I'm going to do now is just go over the field here where aside from the Mac and the Will, now everybody's assignment actually comes the same. Now, this free safety, remember when we were defending a balanced formation, a 32, a 22, he would all, he would always look for the inside two receivers and make sure that they weren't a vertical threat and he would kind of base his drop off of that well now he's doing the exact same thing but it's between three and four strong instead of three strong and two weak all right your sam is still dropping in relation to number two now your mike in this high wall zone here is dropping in relation to number three and that's something that'll get moved around a little bit your field half is still going to reroute number two to the outside field corner still going to midpoint one to two vertical um, everything's pretty much the same there but you actually don't really have to change any of the teaching just make sure that your players understand that 
you know, okay, Sam linebacker, you're still dropping to number two, and you're still aligning between number three and number four. It's just number four is now out of the backfield, if he is at all, right? Mike linebacker, you're still dropping to that potential number four and potentially having to push things. Free safety, you're still dropping deep and reading three to two week, except now it's three to four. But otherwise, it's the same concepts, just flooded over to the field side there. So this is something where Jackson, I'm going to ask you to, uh, I'm going to ask you to help me out and make sure I cover each one of these stress points with every variation that I show, because we're not going to, none of the variations are going to solve all of these. What they do allow you to do is basically let you decide how you're going to get beat. What are you worried about? What are you not worried about? You know, what are you going to make the offense do to defeat you? So the stress points that 41 or 31 with two backs presents is, first of all, your one-on-one -on -one matchup into the boundary there. Any offensive coordinator worth his salt is going to put this best guy there. Um, you, you, in response, usually have to put your best corner at the boundary corner, and if you're confident and comfortable letting him play football, good on you, but that's not a luxury that everyone has, and you don't, necess you don't want one matchup to dictate the outcome of an entire football game. You really want to avoid that, especially if that matchup isn't advantageous for you. Number two is a very similar – or Really, I've got them A, B, C, D. So stress point B is your will on a potential running back with your will on the running back. If the running back is fastened to the flat or if he motions out, your will has to potentially take him man on man. So now you've got an inside run fitting linebacker matched up in space on a running back. Um, that's generally not very advantageous for you. C, conflict C to the field here, is a potential run-pass conflict between the Mac linebacker or Mike linebacker and your number four receiver. Um, I'm not going to get into the RPO game as much. Um, for now, we're just going to uh, imagine a token play action where the quarterback gives a quick fake and the, and the Mike linebacker has to take his read step step forward and fill his gap instead of immediately being able to relate to number four, what does that give up in the quick passing game when he has to take that read step and be late to his zone? And the fourth is, uh, the fourth stress point is the same conflict um, pushed over outside one. And it's between your Sam linebacker and your number three receiver, right? And that can be especially tough in 31, where this number four is now in the backfield and number three has all this space that he can potentially manipulate when your Sam linebacker is in that conflict, right? If you want to stay sound there, now it's affecting how you play the run. Um, you've got to potentially adjust your fronts, adjust your techniques. And we, if you want to do that stuff, that's great to you, but we want to avoid being boxed in and forced to do something by an offense, especially something as simple as lining up statically in a formation. Yeah, I think the the challenges that people are starting to see in, in 31 and 41, um, I think this slide is one of the best that we have, you know, to, to put through in this clinic because I think different teams, right, you don't really recognize – the stress is the same way just because of the strength of your players, right? right. So if, if you, you know, if you start coaching on a team with an elite boundary corner, right, you might be looking at this and going, yeah, well, we just solve all that by manning the guy up. And that's right. awesome when it works, right? But if you can't do that or, you know, you eventually play a team whose best receiver is better than your boundary corner, now, like you said, you're, you're kind of stuck in that, in that world and you don't really have another adjustment. And then I think sometimes what happens there is, and I've been a victim of this myself, you start scrambling to try and fix problems without being aware of the other problems that those solutions will create. 
So I think this as like a framework to look at, you know, defending 41, you know, what's the offense going to do and, and where am I under stress? I think it's super valuable for, for coaches listening. Yeah, and that's a really good point I, I brought that I kind of touched on earlier about having multiple solutions out of a static look, especially if they overlap. So let's just say you have one solution that takes care – you have one call that can take care of stress points A and B and one that can take care of stress points C and D. You know, that, that might be a little bit simplistic, but at the very least now you have the flexibility of – saying, okay, am I more vulnerable to a matchup or a run-pass conflict, right? You can, you know, when it's uh, second and long, you don't have to worry about a run-pass conflict, right? Or if you're comfortable that week uh, with your guys, man, you know, man up and you decide you want to stay comfortable and sound against the run, you can choose to do that instead. But having those multiple options against in a static front uh, is so, so valuable to me. And the other uh, thing I should qualify going forward is I have the boundary half generally drawn up in a static position and stemming down into his position from the waggle in order to achieve this. If you feel like that's going to be too much to teach your guy or you're just not comfortable with that, you can absolutely just go ahead and line him up in the uh, in the spot where I've got him motioning down into. Uh, I'd rather do it the first way, um, kind of maintains the element of surprise, makes a quarterback read something during the waggle, potentially distract him from the snap. But again, if you just want to line him up there a lot simpler, there's nothing wrong with that power to yet. So as far as terminology goes, uh, I'm borrowing a little bit from uh, American Cover 3 now. Um, you don't have to call it this. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, but in general, buzz means the outside linebacker plays down into the flats. And in this scenario, um, he'll actually be a second flat player, either to the field or boundary, uh, depending on – depending on where the boundary half is um, to join the field half there. So if you have a really talented running back and you're worried about them running play side or getting the ball out to them quickly there, it can be useful to have a second guy kind of playing top down in the flats there. Um, sky is when a safety uh, or in this case, boundary half, I'm going to use the terms boundary half and uh, kind of like a second safety or a weak safety pretty interchangeably here. Uh, that's when they come down and play the flats. Or at the, you, well, you'll see in cover three sky, it would rotate the free safety not all the way down to the flats, but it would rotate him at least into that uh, zone where he's relating to number two instead of the sap. Uh, cover three in general is a call just to say that the safeties rotate strong. It's not super relevant if you're not – the reason that it's uh, – I should say the reason that it's put that way is that in American ball, you'll have a lot more teams starting with two high safeties and then rotating into single high, strong, or weak. The only time we really have to worry about that in American football, if you're a single or in Canadian football, if you're a single high team is when you get an unbalanced look like this. And now you need to start just start thinking in terms of is the boundary half coming down strong or is he coming down weak? So cover three, boundary half is rotating strong. Cover six, he's rotating weak. All right, so the first one, uh, we've got first one we've got here. Uh, you'll probably be familiar with some version of having three ways to play 41. You've got your spin where the boundary half rotates over top, your bump where he comes down, uh, your bump where he comes down and just bumps the linebackers over one, or the HBO where he just travels across the formation with number four. This is the first one. It's cover three buzz. So cover three means that our safeties are rotating strong. 
buzz means the outside linebacker in this case the sam is leveraging the flat but the what this does is it helps the free safety he can relate to number two a lot easier in his drop there um you're you get your you get your immediate help in the field flat there and because the flat zone is much easier to recover from in terms of run pass conflict uh, I'd say it generally does a good enough job where you can say it removes that run pass conflict from both really the Sam and the Mike linebacker, or at the very least the Sam. On the backside, you're really taking your chances. Again, you've got your will. Uh, you've got your will manned up with your running back, and you've got your boundary corner uh, manned up with your number one. So if you're not comfortable with those matchups, this coverage is not really for you. If you are, it's a great way to stay sound to the field, especially if you get that fast five to the flat where your will can now push to that high wall, look for any potential divide routes coming across and turn and run with them. Again, your will is gonna have to be really good in coverage to make that work. And then your, your mic can kind of come down and reinforce uh, either this hook to curl zone from the free safety or that flat drop from your Sam linebacker, depending on what's happening. What I, what I like about this version is if, if you're getting like bubble screen or toss or outside zone to the field, like you're really solid or quick game, like all stops, like you're really mm -hmm. solid on that, you know, into that field flat. Um, and I think this is kind of like some teams, this would I say be maybe their base way of, of handling it. You know, like you said, you get in the challenge of what happens when they want to work the ball into the boundary. But, you know, that's where having multiple options is is huge for you. Yeah. And if, if your boundary, if you're comfortable with your boundary half playing high in coverage, too, uh, it's a it's a really great way to handle any problems you might have to the field. So if four goes vertical, then in this instance, the boundary half has it. Uh no, so your boundary half is taking over the so your boundary half is taking over the free safety's deep third responsibility. So he'd be reading uh I guess four to three vertical. So the short answer is yes, but if the four were to come on a divide, you'd have your Mike linebacker uh running with it under your Mike or your Will, whoever's in your high wall responsibility there they'd have to man turn and run with it underneath. And then if three were vertical, the boundary half would have to take that. Gotcha. So that is another potential stress point for sure. Um, cover three sky here, more commonly known as HBO. This is an oldie and goodie. A lot of teams I've seen, they'll just take their boundary half and line him up right across from number four, say let's play football on the back side there. Again, it's the exact same zones as last time, but now your boundary half is in that, uh, your boundary half is in that second flat to the field. And even though your Sam linebacker is like, you would think he's in the run pass conflict, but really your boundary half now is just taking over those responsibilities in the run fit. So you would, that's an element that, of it that you would need to teach or just move boundary half all the way over to number three to keep your Sam linebacker intact uh, if you're more comfortable with that. But otherwise, you've got the exact same zones as the last slide. Uh, we're just changing up who's there based on your personnel, uh, what rules, what assignments fit, what guys better. Again, your Mike linebacker is also pretty sound in his run pass conflict because uh, he's responsible for anything coming to him. He, if he's going to relate to guys, he's got enough time with the flat, with the reroutes. He's got enough time to get there a little bit late and make sure he's solid against the run first. So the, the last thing I quickly forgot about here is if you get number four, um, adding in late to some kind of zone away or coming across a, or coming across in some kind of split zone, um, you really have 
like you're short a guy in this boundary flat um, and you're short a run fit to that side as well. So that's something that would be another weakness uh, in both this cover three buzz look and the next look, which is uh, cover three sky, which is the same assignments, but with different personnel. Now, cover, what cover six does is at the very least, it makes sure you've got a guy, an extra guy in the boundary to fit the run there, even if you're still leaving your guys otherwise man on man. Now, what that does is it leaves us with only five in the boundary. So we're playing five over four. I think we're still pretty good. Um, I'm more comfortable with that. If you need to leverage the flat now, your whoever is in this orange assignment and you'll see it'll the guy will be in a different color based on what they have to do but if the back is a fast five to the field um your mike linebacker now needs to push down and leverage that to the flat if you if you feel like you need that um and this orange player has to drop off of the back and take over that high wall uh responsibility Otherwise, you're five over four, pushing between the will and the mic or whoever's orange here and whoever's green here, uh, pushing the coverage there ensures that you've got six over five if the running back is a fast five. And now, if the running back is a fast two to the field, you've got a three over two, so you're a lot more sound there. And in either a cover four look, which would be both the boundary corner and boundary half high, or a cover six look, which would be the boundary half rotating low and interchanging assignments with the will, uh, you're a lot more sound to the boundary versus one or the other. So the first one we have here following the naming convention, cover six means we're rotating down to the boundary sky means that your boundary half is playing the flat now since we don't have a deep player we can't just play two underneath zones or one underneath zone we now the boundary half is the orange player he has to man up the running back uh if the running back is a fast two now boundary half on a running back is a much better matchup for you in the pass game versus that especially in 42 empty or if the running back is really fast um, gets to a wing where he might be a vertical threat as well uh, boundary half is a much better matchup than your will so maybe you're comfortable with your boundary corner matchup but not so much with your will on your running back uh, this is a great way to get the same reinforcements with your to the field with your two half players um, your five over four, your avoidance of a run pass conflict for the most part. Uh, actually, at, yeah, your avoidance of a run pass conflict at all and your high wall taking care of anything coming across. And why I say we avoid a run pass conflict there is because if number four is in the backfield and you're in a 31-2 back, your Sam linebacker is out of the fit but again same as hbo the boundary halfback is now in the run fit and because he's actually manned up on the running back there's no run pass conflict for him there at all right wherever the running back goes is where he goes so he, he doesn't have to worry about that at all you're still sound versus the run to both sides um in this look and you've got a much better pass, uh, match up in the passing game on that running back yeah, I think having having that boundary half on the new potential two week is is a lot more comfortable, um, you know, for most coaches, especially if you are getting a team that goes empty, um, mm -hmm. or if you just want to have options for if they go empty, we can check to a different coverage. Um, you know, that's that's really helpful there. Yeah, that's that's kind of the same point I was talking about with uh, not being a check defense where you check versus forty one, you check versus empty. You ultimately want what you do to work against empty, to work against uh, 41, 31, 23, which is a whole different topic, and then kind of work backwards from there, in my opinion. Absolutely. 
So in this, in this next one here, we've got cover six, which is a boundary half rotation again into the boundary. And we've got cut, which is a naming convention that I didn't go over in the first time uh, or with cover three, because it's generally useless to play the field corner low in the Canadian game. Um, I'm sure some people do it and they have a good reason to do it, but as a general core coverage, um, it's not something that I find has a whole lot of utility. The boundary though, that's a little bit of a different story because it's much more compressed. So now you can actually play some zone. Um, you've got your three high here still. Your boundary half now has that deep uh, responsibility where he's dropping to the He's dropping to the numbers. He's reading two to one vertical, especially if that back uh, empties out or lines up in a wing as a potential vertical threat. Um, your boundary corner now plays with plays with leverage, and I think from coaching staff to coaching staff, uh, depending on what you want to do, what you want to get out of this, will probably determine your alignment. Um, even if you trust him to get off of a block or not. The theory here is that the boundary corner, since he's playing in the flat, can help fit on the run. But when you get out onto the field and see it happen, and especially versus a downhill running play, like inside zone, you'll find by the time the boundary corner gets there, it's still five yards downfield or so. So maybe you want to line him up inside if you're wor worried about getting that extra hat against the run um or you have your front really try and spill everything out to him and you just let him play with outside leverage there like it's a little more common in this really it's a cover two look into the boundary and that's the other way i kind of look at this and think of it is you, you you're running cover six cut where you're also just kind of running two separate coverages, right? With this, as long as you've got a wall player that can handle any transitions across that divider um, over the center, you're kind of playing one thing to the field and one thing into the